All right, so we're gonna start something new here. I've asked around kind of what people would need or maybe want, and one thing that I think could be very helpful is just going over some questions. Basically, the practice questions you have in the back of a book, or maybe you've purchased some, we also have some on our website, that kind of thing, but a lot of times you just get stuck just answering questions and then you get them right or you get them wrong and sometimes you just don't know why. So what I was figuring we could do is just maybe go over four or five questions. I'll do this, you know, as often as I can and we'll just talk through them. I think the reason this can help is because I can give you a few tips on how I answer questions, how to maybe think through the question. A lot of times the answer to the question is actually in the question itself. So there's some tips on you know answering questions and this all just helps to decrease study anxiety while you're in the exam. So we'll go over, I think I have five questions here, so we'll just go over them. If you ever have any questions that you're stuck on, please send them to me. You can find it on our website or you can message me, you know, through any of these avenues, Facebook, YouTube, and I'd gladly go over any of the questions, especially ones that you're stuck on. So let's get into this. So which of the following is the least likely cause for attenuation? So when I read a question, there's always a word that's going to just kind of stick out to you. So this is saying, which of the following is the least likely? So let's remember this here. So even on the test, if you can, on your scratch paper, write it down or just write the word, the one that kind of sticks out to you. So we know that we're looking for the least likely cause for attenuation. So what's the least likely thing to cause attenuation? Some of these values, it may not be just... Um, intuitive as to which it is. Sometimes you may just have to know which one it is. But let's talk about each of these and then we'll kind of see which one we, you know, think is the, the best answer. A lot of times these are, you know, they're all right, but one of them is better than the others. So first we have absorption. This is where the sound beam enters the body and actually just never comes back. The body retains the energy and does not send it back to the transducer. So if I'm sending out you know, a sound signal and it's 100%, what I'm getting back is let's say 99%. Well, where did that 1% go? Part of it's gonna be absorption. And this is um, usually because as the tissue vibrates from the, the sound wave, it actually heats up. So some of it's gonna be lost as heat. Some of it's gonna be lost as that motion. Um, so basically the energy is being used to do something other than travel back to the transducer. So absorption is one of them. Reflection, with a reflection you have, you know, you, you're, let's say we're imaging a liver here and our sound wave enters. Some of it will be reflected on the surface, you know, all the different speckles all the way down will reflect some, and that's just, that's stuff coming straight back at the, at the at the source. So reflection is some of it, but generally reflection is sent back to the source and so we don't we don't lose that what we do lose is if you know if if, if a beam's coming off the the probe at an angle like this and it hits us a, a big reflector here we do get some of that to come back this way and so this reflection maybe is lost or maybe it does come back after it bounces again and then we get you know some kind of artifact so that's reflection refraction happens and we know again you know we're looking at let's say we're looking at our liver Refraction happens at the interface between two separate tissues. So, you know, if we have our body tissue up here and our liver tissue down here, our sound wave is going to enter, and when it, it meets this boundary, maybe it refracts off to the side. We lose that information. We're not going to get a signal back for that particular sound wave because it's been lost to refraction. It's bent away between two separate tissue interfaces. So let's look at the last one, scattering. So again, we're looking at our liver and there's lots of little tiny liver pieces in here. And as the sound comes in, it's gonna hit in each individual one and send little bits of sound in every direction. Most of it will come back. It's like bouncing a basketball on the pavement. You push it down, it's gonna come back up. But have you ever noticed sometimes there's a pebble on the ground and it hits the pebble and it shoots off to the, you know, a different direction, it scatters. So some of this sound is gonna scatter and it's just gonna be lost. So when we think about which one of these is the least likely cause for attenuation, remember we're most worried about the least. The least likely cause will be refraction. And I'll tell you why. So let's, let's talk about these real quick. So what will happen if we send a beam into the body? Absorption will happen. It's going, the beam is going to inter interact with the tissue and it's gonna heat it up. That's, that's a fact. It's, it's so minuscule, it's, it's not a lot, but it will happen. 
reflection will happen. If it didn't, then that means that the beam's traveling straight on through the body and straight on through everything and never coming back. Nope, reflection will happen 100% of the time. Refraction may happen, and that's because it has some variables. If the tissue here is much different than the tissue here, refraction happens. But if they're the same or very near the same, refraction might not happen. So if we're going from soft tissue to soft tissue, refraction's not going to happen. If we're going from fat to soft tissue, a minor bit of refraction will happen. Now scattering, again, is it's going, the sound wave is going to interact with all these little tiny different particles and it will scatter. So what I tell myself is absor absorption will happen, reflection will happen, refraction may happen, and scattering will happen. So the least likely cause will be refraction because these other three are going to happen. All right, let's get to the next one. So what is the most appropriate action for the sonographer to take when receiving a verbal order for an exam? So we are looking for appropriate action, and it's by the sonographer when we receive a verbal order. The reason I'm including this question is there is a lot of patient care questions that have been added to the exam, and I want you to see how, how they're worded and how you can answer them. And this is one that you get. So if I receive a phone call, I have a, a, a provider on the phone, saying I want to have this exam done, you know, patient's leg swelling, let's do a DVT study, I'm going to send him over. What do I do? Well, do I deny performance of the exam until a written request is received? In a perfect world, but no, we, we have to take care of our patients, so we don't really deny anybody. Just because a request isn't written doesn't mean that it wasn't an order for an exam. And again, we're talking a verbal order. Do we seek approval from our supervisor? Would you do this on every exam? What if it's three in the morning? What if the only person in the hospital is the ER doc and you? Do you call your supervisor? Not really practical either. We verbally repeat the request back to the referrer to verify for correctness. Well, this is something we do wanna do, for sure, because if he tells me on the phone, patient's got swelling in the leg, can you do an ultrasound? I'm gonna send him over. I don't think that's enough information. For one, is it both sides? Is it one side, right leg, left leg? What if he said right leg? but he actually meant left leg, which happens all the time. You want to repeat back the order that you were given, the verbal order, and verify it while you have the provider on the phone. So this one sounds pretty good. So this one sounds promising. Let's, let's keep that one. Uh, document two forms of ID of the patient. Does this have anything to do with having a verbal order from a provider? Not really. So this doesn't sound good either. So to me, the answer will be, that we're gonna verbally repeat the request back to the referrer and verify the correctness. These other ones are things that can happen, but this is something that should happen. So again, I always ask myself, which is the most correct? This is kind of correct, maybe. This, we'll get a written order eventually, but we need to do this on everyone. So to me, C would be the correct answer. In an unfocused transducer, what is the region between the transducer face and the point where the beam diverges? So what's important in this question? Well, unfocused, that's, a, that's an important word. And then the, let's see, we're looking for the region between the face and the point where it diverges. So basically the point where it diverges in the face, what's that place called? So if we have our transducer, you know, if the beam looks like this and then it diverges, this is our focal, focal point, is that different than something that looks like this? This one here is, an, is a focused transducer because it's kind of focusing down. The focal point is actually smaller than the face of the transducer. Technically, it's going to be the crystal. This would be an individual crystal. On this one, it's kind of straight on down to the focal point, and then it diverges. So this would be an unfocused. Basically, the, the beam is the same width as the crystal, straight down to the focal point. The reason this is important is this is a question that could catch you on the exam. If you don't catch this as unfocused transducer, you'll be thinking that it's this point, which is different than this point, even though they, they kind of look the same. So basically the near field, yeah, it's, it's, this, it's this place before the focus. Where, it, where you can get tripped up is, this is basically the, the focal field right here because it's focusing all the way down. And this is actually the near field here. We have our focal zone here, and we have our focal zone here, but the name up here can be different, question to question. 
but this one this one here will never be called the focal field it's just always called the near field with an unfocused transducer we know our focal zones down here a side lobe is the reverberations coming off of the side of this so it's not it's not either of those and this back here is a far field so we know it's not that so to me that the answer of course is a our near field a lot of times you'll see this called as our our our, our focal field. So just remember, on an unfocused transducer, the front part of it's the near field. Easy, easy peasy. The reason I bring this question up more is I want you to really to make sure that you you read the question, underline if you can, if not, write it on your paper, because these are the words that will trip people up, and those are the questions where they can stack up, and you miss one or two of these here and there, well, eventually you're gonna miss you know, a few, and it's enough that tips you over where you don't pass your exam. All right, what is the most common cause of a localized vertical non-uniformity in a real-time beam mode image? There's a lot of keywords in here, so we're looking for the most common. We're looking for localized, and this is a big word, vertical, non-uniformity in a real-time B-mode image. So if we have our image, this is saying localized, so it's gonna be one, one area, and it's vertical. So to me, that would look like stripes. I'm thinking there, there's some stripes in this image. Why are there stripes in this image? If this was horizontal, if that, if that word said horizontal, we'd have stripes running this way. So we're looking for vertical, vertical non-uniformity in a real-time image. It's not frozen, it's moving. So if we have our improper TGC, well, to me, that looks more like, more like this, you know. You have your, your little pots all, you know, all over the place. Or there's some artifact that's causing something to happen, but that, to me, would be TGC. B, a de defective transducer element. Well, that can happen. Let's say one of these little crystals is broken. This one doesn't work, and this one doesn't work, and this one doesn't work. Somebody, you know, dropped it. You ever get this image and your heart stops because you get these vertical bands all the way through the whole image. It's not just in one spot. It actually goes front to back. So that, that could be it. A faulty preamplifier. So to me, this is just a, one of those, you know, the, the preamp is kind of like the gain before, but the preamp's gonna affect the whole image. The whole thing's gonna be dark or it's gonna be light. The pre when, you, when you think of something pre, that's before the image is made, usually it's gonna affect the whole image and not just, not just a, a one line. And then the malfunctioning scan converter. So this is after the image is received. So now, again, this would, this would affect the whole image. This is before the image is created and this is after the image is created. So to me, the, the whole image is gonna be messed up with a malfunctioning scan converter or a faulty preamp. So to me, it can't be either of those. These two are similar, but of course, this, one, this one's horizontal. You know, this is horizontal and this is vertical. So to me, the best answer, the most common cause of a localized vertical non-uniformity would be a defective transducer element. So if you look at this, you know, we have the face of our transducer coming across. These are all nice and clear. You have these broken crystals right here. And again, this thing probably got dropped right on the corner. Breaks these little crystals. You see these in the, you know, the, the machine they use in the emergency room that just sits in the corner and gets bumped around. A lot of times, it, every crystal is going to be broken on those. All the old machines are going to have broken crystals. Uh, vaginal probes, a lot of times, get have broken crystals. You go to do an exam and you think you have air, you know, in the probe cover, but it's actually a broken crystal. If it's air, you'll be able to see gel up on the top and you'll see you know, the little space with the air and you can move it around. You can push on it and these things will move around. But with the broken crystal, it starts right at the face, nothing above, right at the face, and it goes all the way to the back of your image. And you can't affect it. You could rub your finger with gel over it and they, and they don't move. So this question I like because, do you see that our, our answers are very similar to answers we had in another question. So we've already thought through what's reflection, what's refraction, what's scattering and absorption. So a prior question can help you answer a later question. So this one says the thermal index is most affected by which type of interaction between sound and tissue? What's our important words? Well, thermal index, and it's most, most, not least, most. And then it'll be a type of interaction. So well, we know these are all interactions between you know sound and tissue, so what's gonna, cause our thermal index to increase the most. Well, what does this mean? What's a thermal index? Well, it's 
thermal, like a thermometer. It's heat. What's going to cause heat? Well, we talked about this. Reflection, you know, the sound wave comes in and it bounces off a little structure and it, it vibrates it. You know, that can happen. Refraction, same thing, comes in. The sound wave actually passes through, but then it kind of shoots off to another angle. That doesn't really do anything. Scattering, sound wave comes in, the sound wave breaks up, and it shoots in all different directions. What do we have with these three that's different? Well, the sound wave comes in, and the sound wave keeps going. It either comes back in reflection, it shoots off at an angle in refraction, or it goes in every direction in scattering. But the energy is all retained in the sound wave, and the sound wave sent off. The difference with absorption, the sound goes in, it hits the little piece of tissue, vibrates it, whatever, but it heats it up. The energy stays in the tissue. It doesn't go anywhere else. So it's going to heat up that little piece of tissue. So to me, absorption will be the, the interaction which most affects the thermal index because it's the one that will heat up the tissue. All right, hope some of those tips help. Um, we'll do more of these. If you have any questions, of course, send them in to me. Take care.